Hi everyone, um, welcome to my session called Drupal Anti-Patterns. Um, thank you very much for coming. Um, before I start, I'd like to just uh, give a little brief introduction of myself. My name is Joe Chin. Um, I'm currently living in, Can in Singapore. I'm a Canadian expat living in Singapore for quite a number of years now. Uh, and I've been making quite a few trips down to here in Australia. And uh, I thank you for welcoming me here in your country. It's, uh, it feels like I'm back home in many ways, coming to Australia. Um, so I've been working in software for a really long time. I'm not going to say how long, because that just embarrassed me with my age. Um, but I've worked with ERP software, which is in manufacturing, HRM, human resource management, uh, insurance, um, CMS, obviously and more recently, digital experience. So I've been kind of working with lots of different software applications, platforms, things like that. Um, in terms of Drupal, 15 years of experience. Um, pretty much doing everything from project management uh, to module development, uh, theming. Back in the older days with Drupal 6, you could kind of be this full stack developer knowing pretty much everything around the application. These days, it gets a little bit more complicated because um, you know, the, the application is just that much more complex. So you kind of specialize in one area. Um, and you know, I wouldn't say I'm an expert at one. Um, I tend to be kind of like a generalist. Um, but over the 15 years, I have collected some worthy, I guess, experience that I'd like to share with you today. Currently, I am a technical account manager at Acquia. You may have heard of us. Um, in this particular capacity, I, I look after a handful of some of our top, uh, top clients in the APJ region. Um, and oftentimes, you know, what I help them with uh, is technical issues, te typically. Um, I'm helping them with reliability issues, performance issues, um, things like that. Okay, so, so for this talk, I will be kind of sharing some of my experiences that I see with my, my everyday customers. Okay. My email is um, listed below, so if you'd like to reach out to me, um, please do. All right, so what is an anti-pattern? So I just kind of did a you know, casual Google search and it kind of gave me these three different definitions. Um, but generally, a, an, an anti-pattern is a bit of a play on word on a design pattern. A design pattern is often kind of thought of as a best practice for doing something in software development. So the anti-pattern is basically what you shouldn't be doing. And what are some Drupal anti-patterns? So before I kind of go through this list, um, I want to kind of highlight that um, Drupal itself, the core, the core application, generally don't have you know, bad practices. So maybe my slide was a little bit misleading and there's some core developers, core contributors in here thinking, what is Joe talking about by saying there's you know, anti-patterns in the Drupal core? It's, it's, I'm not talking about that. I'm generally kind of referring to custom applications that um, you know, developers working on a project, um, you know, they're throwing up some kind of custom feature and they're implementing bad patterns there or anti-patterns there, okay? So yeah, just to all the um, just to all the core contributors, um, no hate here, guys. <laughs> so today we're going to talk about some of the Drupal anti-patterns that I've encountered. Um, there are many, um, but you know, in the interest of time, I kept it to to basically three of them. All right. So the first one is called long-running batch jobs, okay? and I think um, what I'm going to show is going to be pretty generalized. I'm not going to get too down into the weeds, and uh, I'm hoping that what I'm going to show you will kind of resonate with you because I'm trying to keep it as simple as possible. Okay, so we're kind of talking more about concepts rather than um, deep dive into details right now. So let's start off with a bit of background about what's a long running batch job. Um, so oftentimes there's a goal, um, you know, the, the the product managers might say something along the lines of, you know, we need a nightly job that will um, process a whole bunch of users or a whole bunch of content. Um, you know, we want to you know, apply some kind of flag to all our user base. 
and your user base might be like tens of thousands of particular users. Okay, so that's that's kind of like the, the ask coming from, uh, you know, from your customer. The typical anti-pattern is, um, and now we're looking at the code here, um, is you, and I, I kind of hope you guys do know a little bit about programming, because um, this is not a course about programming. Is that you would have um, an array called users. You know, you have fetched that from a previous um, call. And then you would iterate this user, and then, and then you would then call this particular method called update user, let's say. It could be anything. This method, you know, might take a second to process, let's say, right? And it seems pretty fast when you just kind of do it for one or two, uh, two users. But if you have, you know, a collection of, let's say, 10,000 or 20,000 users, you know, even running at half a second or one second, it adds up to 10,000 seconds. 10,000 seconds, if my math is correct, kind of works out to something like two and a half hours, right? Yeah. And that's considered a really long job, uh, a really long process in computer terms. So, so the problems, as I just indicated, is that you know, it's a single long running PHP process, and it could potentially have high memory usage. Okay? That if you're just operating on one user, then you know, it's a little bit of memory. But, Collectively over 10,000 users, you know, it could get, it can add up, all right? PHP does have some automatic um, memory collection, garbage collection, they call it, but sometimes it can still occur. The bigger problem, however, at least how I see it, is if you have this long-running job running, typically it's kind of done automatically at, you know, middle of the night when, you know, your, your traffic is low, and if for whatever reason, your server gets rebooted or there's an outage of some sort, then this process will just kind of like stop midstream, right? You know, you got 10,000 items, it might stop at 7,000, and then suddenly your server stops. And if you're on a hosted environment, um, this kind of happens, you know, a lot more than you may realize. Um, at Acquia, we have customers um, that you know we're managing their server, we're applying security updates. So we give a you know we give a warning saying, hey, we're gonna reboot your server on such and such a date. They don't always heed that message, and they kind of forget that oh I got a, I got a job running at that time, right? So so the server reboots, kills the job, and then you know they say oh crap you know I didn't get that 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 report in the morning that I was expecting. So, and then the worst thing is that you, you've kind of processed half your, half your items, but then the other half isn't processed. So, so then you have to like, you, you would have to either wake up at the time the server comes back, manually run that batch job because it was executed from, you know, you know, from a cron job that was set up an hour earlier. But then you also don't know where in what spot, um, you know, the process has, has stopped. So then you end up, reprocessing some of those same items. And you could end up with, let's say, um, you know, um, uh, a, 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 a duplication or like a, a doubling up of answers or, you know, some, some, kind, of, some kind of data inconsistency where that, uh, that item has been processed twice. Okay, so, so we, we try to eliminate all these kind of problems. Um, and the last thing, it's a, it's a minor one, but it's really difficult to monitor, you know, at what stage your job is. Unless you purposely put some kind of logic inside this, uh, inside this loop that's, you know, that maybe prints a log, you know, you can't really tell, you know, at what stage your job is at. Okay? So, so these are some of the things that we, we've encountered with, uh, you know, when customers use an anti-pattern like this. So what is the solution? The solution is using Drupal queues. So, um, so basically a queue is exactly what it sounds like. It's, you know, you put something in, you pull something out, right? Um, the Drupal queue system works on what they call FIFO, first in, first out um, um, idea. Um, the first couple lines are just kind of like, you know, um, things to initialize the queue. But, I want you to focus on you know, these last three lines. It's, it's actually it's essentially identical to what the previous iteration was, but instead of processing that user at this point, I'm just, I'm just creating um, a placeholder inside the queue for it. 
And that's actually a really, really, really fast process because it's not doing all the heavy work yet at this point. I'm just kind of putting that item and saying, hey, you know, be prepared to process it. And you can actually process tens of thousands in a matter of, you know, a second or two. So that's, that's a really, really fast process. The next thing that you would do then is you would create what's called a queue worker. Okay? Um, don't get too concerned about the top two lines um, you know, in code. That's, you, know, you can kind of just think as wrapper. But what you notice is that um, this line here, this update user method, is actually identical to what you just had earlier in that you know, anti-pattern. Okay? But what this does is that it means it's processing each item individually inside a single PHP process. So the final thing you do is you set up a cron job that says, um, you know, run my queue, run any, you know, run a process that would execute any items that's sitting in my queue, you know, every five minutes. Okay, so you just kind of create this job that just runs every five minutes, um, and then it would just pick items off the queue and it just execute them one by one. All right. So what are the benefits to doing all this then? So. The benefits of doing all this is when you're executing items one by one, it just kind of creates one PHP process, um, finish the job, and then, and then close that process and then execute a new one. So you end up with a PHP, PHP process with a very small footprint and that doesn't really last a long time. It lasts for like, let's say a second, right? If your server happened to uh, reboot and you have this big long list of queue items, um, it doesn't create any kind of data inconsistency because the queue is, is saved. It's saved on the database, and when your server reboots, um, reboot, come back up, um, cron will run every five minutes again, and then just pick up whatever item is in the queue and then just kind of proceed on merely. And the last thing, you know, admittedly is a small little benefit, but you can just run a single drush command to see how many items are in the queue. And that just makes it really easy to say, oh, okay, I'm 50% of the way through, I'm 75%, whatever it may be, right? Okay, so, so that's the benefits of using Drupal Q. Um, super easy, but not everyone's familiar with, with this concept. Okay, let's move on to the second anti-pattern. This one's a bit of a mouthful, um, process blocking external API calls. And um, maybe I'll just go on to my next slide to make it a little bit easier to comprehend what I mean by this. So I see this one pretty often as well. Okay, so the goal is to display individual uh, information on a web page. Um, and this information comes from an external server. Maybe you have a CRM uh, connected with your, your, your Drupal site. And it's pulling out you know, individual user information. Um, so generally that means that the page is not cached. The typical anti-pattern to kind of creating this kind of logic is um, in the black box you have, uh, you could create a custom block and inside that block at some point you would execute some kind of API call to your external server um, saying, you know, fetch me the user profile for user123. Then once the response comes back, you would then execute the next, um, you know, the next set of uh, uh, statements, which is to theme that result in your page. And then after it does all that, then it renders the HTML back to the user client. The problem with this particular uh, pattern is that when the user, um, you know, tries to load the page, they're first confronted with, you know, basically a blank screen, because it makes a request to the server, the server then calls this external API. This API might be a bit slow, you're not in control of it, it might take five seconds, it might take 10 seconds to come back. And this whole time the, the, the user is staring at a screen looking at, you know, basically a, a, black, a blank screen, right? So this is not the greatest user experience. Um, a secondary problem is that the page itself is not cacheable, because um, we're making a unique request for this particular user, right? So, so yeah, so it, so it just kind of ends up being a, a pretty, a pretty uh, unpleasant experience for the end users because they're waiting, they're seeing this little hourglass that's going, but 
it's not going anywhere for any time soon. So what is the solution to handling these type of issues? So we basically break it up into two parts, um, using REST API and using what's called asynchronous JavaScript. Okay, so so the, the way to go around this is you would create a custom API uh, on Drupal using probably REST. And it will be responsible for calling this you know, slow service, right? Then that block that you used to, you know, that was used to initially create you know, the information on here, you don't use that to call the external API. All you're doing with that particular block is you're injecting JavaScript. Right? The JavaScript um, is static. It's going to be the same. Um, and when it loads up into the client browser, the JavaScript would contain what's called asynchronous Java, uh, uh, asynchronous Java, you know, an asynchronous call. And what that would do is it would then call your custom API. In the background, what's happening? So, so here you have to understand a little bit between what's asynchronous versus synchronous processing. With, with asynchronous processing, it's, it works kind of like this if you're not familiar with it, is that, hey, can you do me a favor? You know, I'm going to give you this. You go and process it. But I'm not going to hang around and waiting for you to come back with a response because I got better things to do. And that better thing is I'm going to process all the other JavaScripts that are part of, you know, that's part of my front page or, or where it may be, right? And so I make this asynchronous call. It goes into Drupal because that's where I create the API. So that's kind of like down here in the blue, in the little blue box. It goes into Drupal and then it kind of, you know, takes a sweet time getting some kind of response. The JavaScript, mean, meanwhile, is not waiting for my response. The front page is now loading up other things that is necessary to show off to your user. And that happens actually relatively quickly. Okay, so the end result, what happens is that the user gets most of their, their page content already rendered because that's actually cacheable. So they come onto this page, 90% of the information, 95% of the information is already there. They're left maybe with you know, this, this blank spot here where it doesn't have their, um, you know, their user detail, but then you kind of have some kind of hourglass here that just kind of says, hey, I'm, I'm, I'm going to fetch the information. Then when the API, um, you know, when that, that, that asynchronous call does finally get back, um, if you coded your JavaScript correctly, it will then handle that response and then display the information into that little block. Okay. So, so what are the benefits of using um, this particular um, use case? Is that the user generally experiences a very fast page load, um, you know, when they first come to to that particular page, because um, everything is all cached. The asynchronous API call doesn't block um, everything else from happening. You know, if you have other kind of JavaScript widgets going on in the background, it just continues merrily and, you know, doing its thing. So the user, while they're waiting for, you know, the, let's say their points update, can then be distracted by other things on your page, right? So generally the user is happy. And secondary, it, it just, you know, have less stress on the Drupal server. Um, you know, the API call that Drupal's making still kind of waits a long time but it's a REST API and that doesn't take up as much resources um, as, you know, like, let's say loading up a full customized page, right? So overall, it just leads to less resource um, utilized on the server. Okay, so, so that's, that's another kind of good, um, you know, this is what, you know, we consider a good best practice. But it's very easy, you know, for um, particularly newer, newer programmer, to kind of fall into this trap, right? Um, I myself have kind of fallen into this trap before, and you know, sometimes I'll be fine if it's you know, just a small little site. But when you're kind of building at the enterprise level where you know, you're expecting tens of thousands of users you know, in a given hour, let's say, then these kind of things matter, okay? How are we doing on time? Okay, I think we're pretty good. I'm not checking my messages. All right, so my third example, is blindly increasing the PHP memory limit. 
And I'm all certain, you know, if you guys did any kind of work on Drupal, you would have done this yourself. I've done it plenty of time until I kind of figure out, oh, okay, this is bad. All right, so what's the background behind this? So the ultimate goal is to, to kind of like get rid of um, these PHP out of memory errors in your error log. Um, you know, presuming you do read your, your error log messages, which every good developer should. Usually you're not aware of it, but you know, it, it does appear, um, and, and often the use case is that you're asked to build a page, you're building it, it looks great, and then when you deploy it on production, for whatever reason, it didn't work as expected. You know, in a good scenario, you'll get part of your page and some of the information is missing. In a real bad situation, you just end up with a blank screen, you know, white screen of death. Okay, so you go into your PHP error logs and then you see this, um, this error called PHP fatal error. Allowed memory size has been exceeded. Uh, so basically it says, you know, you ran out of memory. And a very, very typical first move, if you know, you're, you're kind of familiar with how um, server configuration is done. Uh, and this is one of those kind of like, you know, a little knowledge could be a, a dangerous thing. So you go into your PHP settings and you say, okay, well, I'm just going to increase the memory on that. Right now it says 64 megabyte. That's way too low, so I'm going to increase it to 128. You run your test again and it fails, so then I increase it to 256. And you keep doing this iteratively. Okay, you keep repeating this um, until you, know, you, you find some value that gets rid of the, the error message, right? So now we're up to one gigabyte, okay? So that's really, really bad though, but you know what, hey, it solved this particular use case. But that's bad because for a couple of reasons, um, when you just blindly increase the memory limit, and if you, you kind of don't know, you know really what you're doing, um, and not adjust some of the other server configurations, you can actually crash your system. And you know, I'm not gonna get into those kind of details, but basically what happens is that you, you allocate too much memory to PHP, and then it takes away from you know, your overall um, Apache server memory, right? And, and basically it then eats up all the available memory limit on your operating system, and then your system just crashes, and that's a really bad thing, okay? So if you thought, oh, just getting the white screen of death is bad for one user, you know, it's really bad when you crash the server doing it this way. All right, so that's, that's really bad. <laughs> The other problem with increasing um, the memory limit without kind of, you know, thinking about why you're doing so is that there's a, um, I guess there's a, um, an exponential relationship with how much memory you have versus how much um, um, PHP processes you can run concurrently. Okay, so if you have two gigs of memory available for PHP and you set your PHP memory limit to one gig, then it's, you know, you just, you end up with two concurrent PHP processes allowed. If you reduce that memory to, let's say, 256, then, you know, you do some math, just have trust me on this, then it becomes um, like eight concurrent processes that you can run at the same time, right? And why this happens is that um, when you say a memory limit, you know, of X, when PHP runs that process, it just allocates you know, that exact amount to the process, regardless whether it needs it or not. You know, it's it's kind of like you've been tasked with um, transporting people back and forth from one location to another, and each time it's like one or two passengers, but you're, you know, you're driving a huge bus, right? There's a lot of wasted resources going on, okay? so. Um, so that's bad. So it reduces the number of concurrent PHP processes, which ultimately means you can't have as much throughput going, going on. So how do you fix this? And here, my fix is actually not to, you know, like start twiddling around with Apache um, settings and all that, because that actually gets pretty complicated. It's a whole discipline on itself, right? But there are some things in Drupal that you can do to, to, to fix that. So, the first thing you have to do, though, is understand how much memory you know, your processes are using. 
So, um, and, then, and then set your PHP memory limit to it. So what is meant by typical? So, so you use something like um, the web profiler, uh, the, the web profiler module, it can tell you what the, you know, what the memory usage is for a particular, for a particular page. Um, if you're subscribed to something like New Relic, which offer free accounts, um, you can use it to come up with statistics that says, you know, the average memory usage per page is this and so forth. So I'm not gonna get into that. But you have to figure out how much memory is appropriate for your particular application. I'm gonna give you a little, little um, you know, a little tip. Almost all my customers, 99% of the requests, and these are customers that have literally tens of thousands, if not millions of hits a day. 99% of them use less than 256 megabytes in the processes, okay? So the vast majority of requests are actually somewhere around 128 to 150 megabytes. Few more kind of hits to, you know, come closer to 256. Um, and then there are some that kind of goes beyond that limit, right? But we have a, we have a way to handle those kind of like those, those top memory hogging processes. But you would set your PHP limit to, you know, whatever that typical value may be, all right? Then the next thing you do is you install this image magic PHP extension. And why you do this is because most of the time when there is high memory usage is due to image pre-processing. So in, in Drupal, image pre-processing means you, you're updating an image file and then it kind of does a thing with the image styling where it, uh, it crops or compress and, and do all those kind of things to make your, your like 64 mega, megabit image down to something reasonable for the internet. Okay, so that's, that's what's referred to as image pre-processing. That process is really memory intensive. And the larger the image file is, not in terms of, of, of size in, in file size, but in terms of resolution. So if you have like something huge, like 20 pixels by 20 pixels, that eats up a ton of memory. And it's so in those one-off cases that you then run out of memory. So the easy fix is just to install this extension called ImageMagic PHP, okay? Um, because by default, Drupal actually uses this, this processing library called GD. But for reasons that's too technical to get into, it, you know, both process, you still use a fair amount of um, memory. But the way that ImageMagic does it, it doesn't utilize the PHP memory limit that has been set you know, by this memory limit uh, setting. It does it separately. So it's not constrained by that. So you can you know, more readily process large image files um, using image magic PHP, okay? So that's, that's number two. And then we still have to address, you know, the elephant in the room, which is I still have certain processes that eats up a lot of memory, right? There are just some that, and that's where you do what's called a conditional increase of PHP memory. So um, I hope you guys can read it from back there. So basically, in your settings.php file, you would have some kind of um, you know, if condition that says, if the URI that you know, is being hit at this point is you know, image processing or whatever it may be, right, um, that, that caused you know, the high memory usage, then you would then um, you know, just set whatever memory limit is necessary just for that particular process. And once that process is done, it will then revert back to the normal, you know, lower default setting. Okay, so that's how you address these kind of memory issues. And generally what you find is that, yeah, you know, out of 20,000 requests, you know, one or two might hit this, right? And, um, but the rest of the 19,000 some odd requests are using the more efficient uh, memory limit. Okay. All right, so um, I kind of already said most of what I want to say, you know, in, in the previous slide. But yeah, basically you end up with, um, you know, more efficient, you know, usage of the, of the server resources. And that ultimately leads to, you know, handling more page requests and higher throughput. Um, 
And more importantly, is you're reducing the risk of PHP processes running out of memory, giving the users that black uh, that, that white screen of death, or even worse, having your, your server crash. Okay. So that's it. Three, you know, fairly simple uh, concepts. I hope you guys can take back to you know your next project. Any Any questions? Yep. Yes? Oh. Okay. Yeah, yeah, go ahead. Yeah. Okay, um, so I see that you temporarily um the function temporarily increased to five hundred and twenty megabyte. Mm -hmm. Um is it okay if so for example if the request is larger than that, is it okay to temporarily increase that to one gigabyte? Yeah, yeah. I mean it's it's just for that one process, right? Yeah. And that's probably okay, right? But, but then, I will but add then, a caveat that if you have a process that is one gigabyte, then you might want to evaluate, um, you know, is there something wrong with my code that is taking up that much memory? Technical debt. Hmm? Technical debt. Yeah. It's, it's usually, um, so in, in the previous one I said, you know, um, it's images, right, that tend to be, you know, the cause of, you know, a lot of memory usage. When you're kind of like processing large amount of data, typically it doesn't get to one gigabyte unless you have loaded a one gigabyte data set, right? Typically it doesn't use that much. And if you're loading a one gigabyte data set, then there might be a better solution. Um, so, so that's where you have to explore then, okay, how can I, you know, how can I optimize this? Can I use Drupal Q? Like in my first example. Yeah, okay. Yes? Do you find that with Drupal Q, like yes, mm -hmm. you're queuing the the data set through, which at least stops it from fall from loop being lost when it falls over. Mm -hmm. But do you find that you still have the memory issues from the database table locking going on? When Drupal's, you know, dealing with like a node save that's got so many joins. Uh, I mean well, I found, you know, most yeah. of my memory issues were resolved better by not just the change in the code, but mm -hmm. by fixing the InnoDB buffer pools right. to avoid having to ever increase the PHP memory to um, stop the deadlocks. But then Drupal's on, what is it, Drupal.org's on read committed anyway. Right. But so is the issue about Drupal Q or with this memory setting? No, more like when you were talking about the users in the loop and you queue ah, the right. users. Yeah, I mean, but I think. still doesn't, res yeah, I mean, would that still resolve itself if you ran into all those table locking issues that Drupal is so renowned for? If I'm, under better at? If I'm understanding you correctly, I think they're, they're, they're different problems, right? Yeah. Um, because you was, you know, this is about isolating this processing. Code issue, yeah. Right, it's about isolating um, the process of items one by one, right? Yeah. Whereas in your case, you're talking about I have a single process that just eats up a whole lot of memory. Or more, I'm doing something like that update user. But yeah. If, if and I'm it, using a standard Drupal user, that's this many fields. Mm -hmm. But if I've gone and added my own custom fields to that user and I've got a mm. complex account system, then all of a sudden that update user is huge anyway. Right. Even if I queue it. <laughs> but then you're talking about just that one user and then it's a separate issue. Yeah. Yeah. Oh, yeah. Okay. okay. Yeah, yeah. Because you're going to fall out of memory anyway if Correct. it's too big a join on that final update that you're running. Like, yeah. you know, user save is in that update user. Yeah. Mm -hmm. And maybe that'll be a topic for my next <laughs> Drupal self. No, that was really helpful. <laughs> Thanks. Yeah. Great. Thank you. Um, any other questions? Uh, oh, quite a few. Uh, this lady Me? up here. Yep. Yep. Go for it. So, what about when you have like a hook update that you want to update, uh, have an, yeah, an update function that you want to mm -hmm. batch update about users or content or something? Mm -hmm. How the queue functionality will play along with it when you batch process your hook update? It's a huge batch right. process yeah. that has to run other parts that it will take forever. Could the queue could be helpful? Um, same update? So, um, so you're talking about hooks, so it sounds like you're on Drupal 7. <laughs> Nothing um, that's well. When, when you oh, you're on Drupal 9. Nine. Okay, yeah, there is still hooks going on. Yeah, okay, fair enough, fair enough. Yep, okay. Um, so, 
the hooks is not necessarily what's calling the job, is it? Uh, yeah. So you would have an individual item, and you know, like I kind of simplified this, right? I just had one method, right? But you may have hook functions being called within this, um, you know, within, you know, within this iterative loop, right? Same concept applies, right? Because when you're when you have a single item and you're ending up calling hook functions. It's still really just part of the same process, right? Um, so they're, they're really not necessarily tied together. Unless that hook function iterates through a large number of items. And then your hook function then can implement this usage of queues. Yeah, the, the whole point was to run a, uh, run a hook, hook update mm -hmm. to update the user names. Right. There's a okay. So positive and that has, yeah. that has a queue behind it. So okay, so that's, that yeah, was so kind of my question. Is batch, queue yeah. part of it, or you can the batch API mm -hmm. is on top of queue? And yeah. when you use progressive batch, and that sandbox is a, is a progressive batch. So, so I don't need to worry about if you use that, into yeah. it'll take a long time to run when the Josh update runs, and it'll just keep spinning out the progress over the time. There you go. Okay. I told you I'm not, I'm not an expert at any one thing, but I have a wide wide, uh, wide uh, array of knowledge. So thank you very much for that answer. That's right. It's specifically the software yes. Which is in yes. the fashion that you right. find out. Yeah. So maybe that's the solution. So polite. <laughs> <laughs> um, I think there was a gentleman in the backpack. Yep. Yeah, I'm not sure. It might be answered by that. But um, how does the batch API uh, compare to the queue API? Like when, you, when you're using one or the other? Is there a difference? Right. Um, the batch API. Um, I'm gonna say it's probably not as as um, resilient as as using queues um, because what's happening when you're doing batch API is that um, and unfortunately I don't really have a working example here to show you but you're typically on um, on a screen <coughs> and when you kind of like hit start uh, what you'll you'll often see is that um, it will process items one by one right. Um, and the batch API is really good when you when each of those individual processes eats up a lot of PHP memory, right? Um, and you kind of want to isolate them to to kind of like run one at a time. But the problem with using the batch API is you still need to have your connection back to the server. So here, it doesn't even matter if the server is kind of continually running, but if your network connection happens to fail, then because it's, it's sending the signal back to the client each time, right? So it processes on the client, and then the client kind of you know, gives a signal, says, okay, process the next one, and it's kind of updating. But when you break that connection, then the whole batch just kind of fails, okay? And these batch processes, um, I may be wrong here, but you usually initiate it through the front end, right? Um, so it's not quite as robust where using queues, you can just kind of create a cron job. To, to execute it. I did actually experiment one time where you're creating batch processes um, because sometimes people want to have that visual that it's happening right now and to implement queues. So you can actually do the combination of creating queues and running those items in the queue through a batch so that people can see um, and get kind of real updates to it, okay? Other questions? No? Okay, great. Um, I'm going to leave you. Thank you. I'll leave you my email address here. Um, I'm a technical account manager, so don't feel if you know, you're going to call me, I'm going to sell you something. <laughs> um, so yeah, do feel free to, um, to ping me if you have questions, you want to understand a little bit better of what I said today. Thank you very much for your time. Thank you.